Okay. Thank you, uh, the organizer, for giving me the chance to talk in this amazing conference. You know, I have a chance to talk after the monster of uh, the shoulder, and so I'm really honored to do that. So, but let me, I mean, and thank you for uh, the audience. I really want to thank you, the audience, for being so brave to stay here in the evening, in a Saturday evening. So, actually, uh, I would like to uh, take you uh, my perspective, which is kindly different perspective, is an engineering perspective. And I would like to share with you the rationale that was beyond the development that I'm going to present you. So actually, uh, I know this doesn't mean anything to you, but it was uh, an old image that came to uh, in my hands a long time ago. And this was an exam I had uh, at the university. And actually, it was kind of weird. The, a similarity that came to my mind looking at this image with our 2D mechanism compared to what a scapula looks like. And so the link actually that are responsible for the motion of this mechanism looks and resembles to me the muscle that are responsible for the uh, scapular motion. Of course, scapula is much more complex than this because actually, unfortunately, is an unstable uh, object because actually it can have more degree of freedom than a rigid mechanism. But actually, a lot of my thinking came from this uh, image. I want to uh, bring your attention also to this uh, that comes from neurological studies. And actually, I mean, the way our brain works uh, when it comes to uh, accomplish a task. And actually, the, the way the brain works is actually is the brain is focused on the result, on the function of the task I'm, I'm, I'm going to perform. And actually, there's a sequence of automatic information which are uh, automatically released. I mean, when I'm thinking of doing something and actually what I really uh, I mean, took, what really took my attention was that we don't really think what we are doing. We really uh, are focused on the uh, goal of what we are doing. And so uh, I think that. Also, this image was very self-illustrating. And so actually, the image was basically showing how uh, a motor pattern change due to a local deficiency. That is to say that actually, when there's a deficiency uh, that, uh, I mean, take place, I mean, our brain automatically replaces the old uh, information with a new one in, in the attempt of trying to overcome the deficiency. So the point is that, and the real question that right now comes to my mind is, so how can I determine if this is uh, good or bad, or this, if this movement is normal or abnormal? And that's where uh, my basic research started, because actually, uh, I mean, I realized from the literature that there was a lack of understanding about Normality, which in my mind should have been uh, the very first point to start from in order to understand the deviation from normality. So the image on the left shows the classical image that is reported in many books about the ratio between glenohumeral and scapulohumeral. But actually, we realize uh, through uh, experimental result that this is a simplification of real life. So I went into literature, and actually, there's plenty of paper presenting right now how uh, a kinematic of a scapula looks like. And so actually, and all this paper measure with different technologies, with different kind of approaches, uh, have in common that they try to measure the free main rotation of the scapula. So everyone seemed to give up on translation and they have been focused on rotation. So basically, the up-down rotation, the tilt, anterior-posterior, and the protraction-retraction involved with intra-extra rotation. By looking at different literature, of course, we can see that there are different range of motion measured. And this is something, you know, that uh, shows how incomplete are the results so far. And also, if you have a close look at the results presented by the various paper, you will see that the range of motion measured in the various degree of freedom are significantly different. So that's when we started thinking in terms of bands of normality and not normal curve because obviously there's a dispersion in the data and this is associated with any experimental experiment that we do actually we don't see always the same result but actually we do see a dispersion and actually that's why it is so much important to define the inclusion criteria that allow you to define what's normal from what is abnormal 
there's, uh, we start also to see this kind of uh, papers. This is not particularly recent, but actually, I mean, people started uh, evaluating deviation from normality associated with a pathology. And actually, uh, this to me was particularly significant and important, and that's where I put all my effort uh, and research in the last few years in order to understand how, this, how and when this deviation displays and occur. So actually, it was clear that 99% uh, uh, of the pathologies can be clearly identified from a kinematic standpoint, and, and so that there's a deviation from normality. And that's where we started doing our activity, and that's where we started measuring a real patient in order to get a, a better understanding about this deviation of core. So quick video to show how it works, because actually, I mean, it would be much difficult to understand what I'm going to present if we don't understand wh what we are doing. Actually, we are uh, using a motion sensor uh, following a specific uh, biomechanical model. And actually, what we do is this. So we collect uh, kinematic information in real time. And basically, we do plot on the x-axis axis, the range of elevation or flexion. And on the y-axis, we do report uh, one single variable at a time. Keep in mind the scapula is a 3D uh, movement. It could be very complex, and so it is necessary to have a better understanding to split and print it in a uh, 2D graph. And actually, we can see the up-down, so the upward rotation of the scapula, the tilt, and the protraction-retraction. And that's what we do. So one basic information, the green area underneath represents the outcome of, of a clinical study, which is about normal behavior. But when we take a new measuring system, I think that the basic question we need to ask ourselves uh, is about two key factors, which are reliability and validity of the result. Reli reliability is about, uh, I mean, what's the error in uh, repeating the measurement and in uh, asking multiple people to do the same kind of measurement. So this is uh, can to do with the accuracy, how reliable is the measurement that we are doing. But validity is, you know, uh, more significant because it gives us an indication about is it real what I'm measuring or is it due to artifacts or whatever uh, not representing uh, the, 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 real, the real life. So, and, and actually, uh, for sure, it is important to understand if what I'm going to present, uh, I mean, fits with these two features. So, Sometimes graphs and curves can be difficult to be understood, and so that's why we try to simplify the understanding of these curves. And that's, uh, we, we did it from a, a geometrical standpoint, and actually what we are doing right now is that we apply several different criteria, or the algorithm uh, applies several different criteria in order to understand how these curves can be uh, easily analyzed. Because actually, one important thing that needs to be understood here is that we are dealing with dynamic. So a static evaluation doesn't allow you to have a complete understanding of the kinematic of the scapula. And that's why it is important to uh, you know, uh, apply a measuring protocol that involves movement. And that's why it is important to evaluate this movement in a dynamic uh, uh, situation and not uh, from a static standpoint. So actually there are multiple parameters. I don't want to spend and I, I don't want to bore you on this, but actually I will give you shortly uh, uh, a practical example of this. This is the example that was uh, thanks to uh, uh, Lexington Clinic. This is a real patient that they measured. And actually you see a practical application of the technology. So you could see uh, a rotator cuff tear and actually a bilateral evaluation where we do see the healthy limb versus the pathological limb on the left side. And then we do see uh, the same measurement taken at three months post-op and at six months post-op. So the question is, can we track the evolution of the patient? Can we measure the evolution of the patient? Can we quantify uh, from an, uh, in an objective way how this evolution uh, occurred? And the answer is yes, because actually we all, all these graphs are uh, possible because there are numbers underneath. And actually we have two types of, uh, of different information. We have qualitative related to the shape and we have quantitative related to the amount uh, of the rotation that we are going to measure. And as we see, how can we say if the patient completely restore the normal functionality 
we can prove through this kind of approach if they have not just recovered a complete range of motion, which, as you know better than me, it could be a partial information because it could be related to a compensation that the patient developed. But if he recover a complete range of motion, done in a physiological or with a more physiological uh, approach. So just to give you some more details about what we do see from this graph. So, so we do see, uh, for example, the uh, lack of the onset. The, we are talking about up-down rotation. So this uh, upward rotation of the scapula. And as we know, this upward rotation doesn't uh, be, doesn't start immediately, but normally it starts after 25 to 35 degree of elevation of the humerus. And that's why it starts engaging. So the first effect of uh, a compensation strategy associated with a rotator cuff tear is to immediately start engaging the scapula at zero degree or close to zero. So one second point that needs to be analyzed is that it is important to evaluate if the elevation or depression uh, are displaying some kind of differences. And the presence of an hysteresis, so a mismatch between the ongoing and return phase is an important information we are gathering. And also the overlap of this curve is another factor that needs to be considered together with the inclination of the curve. So all these factors contribute to, uh, to evaluate uh, and, and measure the evolution. But up to this point, what we have seen is that there's a strong correlation between kinematic, so the way the scapula moves, and muscle responsible for, do, for that kinematic. And that's why we came to this different solution, and that's why we thought that it was important not just to restore the muscle tone of the deficient muscle, but to coordinate that muscle firing with, uh, with the, sorry, Okay, with the, with the other muscle group responsible for the overall kinematics. So actually that's we, uh, where we came with to this solution. So uh, stimulation controlled by the movement that dynamically interact with the, with the patient. So the point is one of the question, one of the most frequent question is how long the effect lasts in the patient. And in order to explain this, I would like to share with you this recent finding, which uh, to me was uh, a great revelation. So let's see, this is a bilateral analysis done on a CrossFit athlete that display on the right hand side, uh, an inversion of the tilt. So this inversion was not evident in terms of range of motion because actually he has a complete range of motion, but actually it was, you know, uh, somehow limited by uh, a snap that was the easy shoulder was having in terms of mechanical impingement at a certain degree of elevation that he was able to uh, uh, overcome. So the point is that, okay, this patient has sort of sore on his shoulder, but actually, I mean, he was still active, but we realized that. And then we applied the um, shoulder pacemaker. So this was the initial situation, and this is tilt versus uh, abduction angle. So as you see, uh, com by comparing the curves that we have measured on this patient towards the normality bands reported in green, this is the opposite of normal. At this point, we were taking the measurement uh, when, when the device was on, and we were measuring, uh, I mean, the same kind of parameters. As you see, we have inverted the tilt in this, in this graph, but most importantly, as you see, you have a perfect overlap of this curve, so the, um, uh, the, his capability to control the scapula or the tilt of the scapula is pretty consistent and repeatable, but then, this obviously it was that way because it was with the device working on. But what if we switch off the device? So, and let's, do, let's uh, look at this graph. This is when the device was off. And actually, as you see, the patient somehow after the first treatment can, you know, memorize and can be able to control the scapula appropriately, even if the device was not working. But as you compare the curves that we have measured, uh, in the various moments, so before the treatment, during the treatment, and after the treatment, which is what I reported in this graph, as you see after the treatment, uh, I mean, he still remember how to engage the scapula properly or how to engage the 
tilt of the scapular property, but it is less consistent than the medial graph, which report the graph when the device was on. That is to say that there's an immediate short-term effect uh, or short-term memory that the patient can still have. And actually, if we do the same kind of measurement 24, 48 hours after the treatment, we will probably uh, get closer to the original curve, so to the orange curve. That is to say that it takes some time to uh, change the motion part, the, the motor pattern uh, that the patient has in his mind. But actually, we can clearly see that by associating the firing moment with the arm position in space, this is a very uh, powerful afference that uh, can contribute to the recreation of a motor pattern. And we are working on bringing more evidences about this, but actually results are really encouraging. It shows that, uh, I mean, you can have an immediate or almost immediate effect, but actually this effect drops off over time if you don't continue in the application or in, uh, in, uh, in the treatment. So about uh, long-term result, I think that this paper uh, from Roder that was already presented, I think in his presentation, uh, the first day, uh, is self-explaining. So actually this was about a specific subset of the population, which was the posterior instability, but actually the control or the uh, measurement they took at 24 months confirmed that after some times, this motor, motor pattern stays in patient brain and they can, uh, uh, they can control the scapula in a proper way without any assistance of the external, uh, an external device. That is to say, so we have been able to see that there's an immediate effect, a short-term effect, and then a permanent or plastic effect after some time of use. Uh, after how many applications, we don't know for sure. This strongly depends on the uh, initial condition of the patient. We have just completed a study uh, made on volleyball player, professional volleyball player, in which we have been able to uh, show that we can restore a better kinematic motion after five weeks of use of, uh, of the device. But actually what we have been able to measure is that the capability of the athlete to learn uh, the uh, new motor pattern strongly depend on the initial condition of the patient. So just to give you uh, uh, an overview about the content uh, of these protocols, because actually, you know, what a protocol is, uh, basically is a series of exercises which uh, are in control and are controlled by the device. And then that actually uh, the patient is required, or the athlete is required to go through in order to, uh, you know, reestablish the motor pattern in his, in his mind. So these are the uh, protocols uh, already released. So, I mean, the first one was about the uh, posterior shoulder instability and then the scapular dyskinesis, which is probably worldwide the, why the, 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 the more used because it's like a general purpose kind of treatment. And then we recently released the uh, uh, protocol for reverse and for, sorry, and for rotator cuff. So some study we are running right now are aiming to establish if this protocol used, uh, should be used only in the post-operative phase or if they may bring some kind of advantage if you start using it pre-operatively also in order to prepare the environment for the surgery. This is an open question and, and I leave the answer to you as an expert. I think that one of the most important thing that we need to consider also is the uh, is the um, analytics collection, because actually, you know, uh, we don't just provide a treatment, but at the same time, we measure an outcome. And the outcome evolution uh, is an important factor that allow us to understand if the treatment is going in the right direction or not, if the patient is learning or not, and if the, I don't know why automatically it moves, but if uh, the results uh, are going in the direction we do expect to have. And this can be done also on a remote base. Thank you.